I wanted the privilege of introducing our minister, uh, and hence I'm here back at the dais. He does not need introduction, but before he makes his inaugural address to us today, on behalf of Fiki, sir, let me once again congratulate you for playing a remarkable role in closing a landmark deal at Bali at the WTO ministerial. Yeah. Yeah. The first ever since the WTO was set up in 1995. Honorable Minister, we are delighted and proud of your exemplary readership, your determination to protect India's interests, and the fine skill you displayed for building a broad coalition of support at the ministerial. You have strengthened India's position in the multilateral trading system and the institution of the WTO, and in fact established India as a leader and spokesperson for the developing world. Your deft handling of the difficult negotiation dynamics, and we were getting pretty much hourly reports from there, have earned well-deserved accolades. It's a great achievement that you have been able to successfully safeguard the legitimate concerns of India on food security, while enabling the trade facilitation advantages to come through. Minister Anand Sharma, you did it. Yeah. Yes, he deserves a big hand for this. Yeah. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you Sri Anand Sharma, our chief guest today, our Honorable Union Minister for Commerce and Industry. Thank you. Before Minister delivers his address, we'll just request him to release what Nana just referred to as our economic agenda, uh, which we, are, we have worked on and, and prepared. It's an honor to have him release it on behalf of FIKI. Thank you very much, sir. Maybe kindly have your inaugural address. Thank you, sir. The President of FIKI, Nana Kidwai, President elect Siddharth Pilla, Jyotsna Suri, Secretary General Didas Singh past presidents of FIKI, YK, Onkar, Saroj Padar, Habil, Harsh, Rajan, Harish Maribala, and Raju Kanoria. I don't see him here. He was here. Now, I am addressing the past, uh, very important. Because as we talk of the present, we have to imbibe one thing. And we are, those who do so are fortunate that the present is transient and temporary. The past is stable and permanent. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not saying anything that we would like to be known as past, but one day we all will be. <laughs> Having said that, let me thank Nana for a leadership that she gave to the FIKI, dynamism, vision. And I'm very happy and proud to have worked very closely with Nana and FIKI and all the leaders of the industry, discussing, reflecting, looking at where India is today, what are the real issues, and what are the challenges. We have been able to forge a very close understanding and a enriching partnership 
between the government and the industry. I feel if India has to continue to, in its journey to move forward, to find its rightful place in the Committee of the Nations, to ensure inclusive growth and sustainable development, this partnership has to be strengthened. We have, in the past, been victims of a mindset where the industry and the entrepreneurs who create wealth, who reinvest wealth, create opportunities and create jobs, were kept at arm's length from government, from administration. But today, it's a different India. Today's India believes in forging these bonds, in benefiting from the wisdom of those who have stepped out, either those who have inherited businesses and continued with the tradition, but many of the first generation entrepreneurs who actually have written their own essay in the India story, as we all know. And I would like to say that we are proud of you as a nation. And we are with you <coughs> when you express your concerns and we understand what those challenges are. When we are talking of India on the move, yes, this nation has constantly been on the move. We are a civilizational country, but a young nation of 1.25 billion people. Majority of our people are young, our sons and daughters. They have their aspirations and they have their dreams. Since 1991, when we embarked on the path of economic reforms, embracing liberalization, engaging with the world, much has changed in India. It was not that India was frozen in the past before 1991, but it's a big change in the world with which India connected after the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the very firm assertion of democracy and the shared values that we have with other democracy, of a commitment to growth, to liberty, and those values which are fundamental in recognizing and respecting human dignity and human rights. Indian entrepreneurs stepped out with confidence, and India opened up. The rest is known to all of you. If you look at the previous industrial revolutions, two to be precise, they were different. When India, Africa, Latin America, these big regions of the world were left out. There was a global growth, industrialization, waves of technology, not benefiting a vast majority of the people of the world. Today, it is different. Today, we have connected, and countries similarly placed, including Africa and Latin Americas, with what's happening in the world. We are not excluded. We are participants, and we are co-authors of the new story being written of global growth, we are jointly addressing the challenges which the world faces. But what has happened in an age when technologies are redefining how businesses are done, global value chains are being created, we live in an information age and a knowledge era. This country has very well connected to that. Why? Is it the Indian mind? Is the newfound confidence? The answer is, lies in both. Because this is the country which always had the mind. This is the country which gave zero to the world. Now, zero is very positive. This is how you move. If you do it anti-clockwise, it can become very destructive. 
But as long as you move in the right direction, nothing moves without the shunya. And therefore, when the new technology revolution came, information technology, communication technology, India was able to connect and bridge the big divide which had left us behind because we were not free nations, we were colonies, we were subjugated. And I give the credit to our institutions and the investment which India had made in those institutions soon after independence, despite the paucity of resources, creating some of the finest in Indian institutes of technology, Indian institutes of management, Indian institutes of science, nuclear science, space science, all were set up because of the vision of one of the greatest, tallest leaders of the Indian national movement, Jawaharlal Nehru. If you move around this India Gate area, when you look at the various institutions, whether fine arts, whether the museum, Saitya Kala Academy, it's not only one area, every aspect was touched. National Institute of Design, only one came up, now we are establishing four more in Ahmedabad. How can India not connect with this reality that it didn't happen abruptly? We had men and women who were going out during a period when opportunities were not there. That was the period of brain drain, as we used to call it. Today the reverse cycle is on. That is important. If we didn't have, if we had not invested in what I refer to, India wouldn't be what India is. And now we are doing much more. More than doubling. That has happened. This country has risen. So much of growth. The developed countries of the world never saw doubling of national incomes within a decade. India, China have demonstrated the fastest doubling of national incomes in the history of the economic growth and development in the, since the industrial age has happened in our countries. That is the truth. Now, if that is correct, there is need to pause and reflect. Where are we going wrong? As Naina said, despondency, gloom. These are worrisome signs. We cannot be in denial, but we need to be correct in our comprehension. Then only we will be in a position to respond in adequate measure, to invoke correctives where they are required, and to correct the perception where we feel the perception is not correct. It's important. Since 2010, we had a great visit of a great leader of a great country, Barack Obama, United States of America's president, then you know his election and the wisdom of the American people. India was one country which applauded. It resonated throughout the world as democracies respect what democracies decide. Soon after that, the narrative changed. I still fail to understand. I recall the meetings in Mumbai and in Delhi and the address of the US President Obama to the Indian Parliament. Immediately after that, nothing to do with that visit, by the way, if anybody gets me wrong, we had a very shrill and negative discourse in India. And the drum beats got louder and louder. Maybe there were issues. Maybe they were not. Time will tell. We all got carried away. Every institution got targeted. Every decision became suspect. Governance became difficult. We were tired of listening the word here and outside, policy paralysis. And I said, what? Where is the paralysis? I can say emphatically in India there was never a policy paralysis. Major decisions were made during this difficult period, ever since the economic crisis engulfed the world. There has been downturn, there has been contraction. Look where India has been. 
Yes, we were not growing at 9% plus. We were dragged down. We can't be insulated from what happens in the world, in a globalized world, interdependent, interconnected. But did we show resilience? The answer is yes. We went back to 8.5%, almost 9 again slipped. They're global factors. They're national factors, too. Global factors, we all have to work collectively, wishing the countries well in the Eurozone and the good news of the strong growth returning in the United States of America. There's strong growth taking place in Africa, in Latin America. These are positives. But during this period of so-called policy paralysis and this shrill narrative and overactivism, I don't blame. Democracies are always noisy. We perhaps became too noisy, and we are. Sometimes, you know, the, we are talking of environment and pollution. This, then sound also affects the environment. Sometimes it's too much. That's why they ban on loud music after 10 p.m. or something. So we have to take care of that for the health of the country, country's mental health, country's self-confidence. We must not allow any situation, and it is the collective shared responsibility of all of us. It includes not only the elected leadership, the political leadership, yes, the corporate leaders, the bureaucrats, our civil servants, and also the media and the judiciary. Our biggest achievement after our independence has been that from day one, unlike many other democracies, we gave universal suffrage. There's the voting right to every Indian citizen, man, woman, rich or poor. Democracy has been India's strength. A democracy which is representative and inclusive. A democracy which is rule-based and rule-governed. A constitutional democracy. Constitution also has a separation of powers between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. The Constitution of India cannot be redefined either by me or by anyone else. This separation of powers, I would urge everyone must respect and not be confused. The issues of governance must be left to those who are accountable directly to the people, who are elected by the people. If people are not happy, with the decisions made, with the policy initiatives, people will throw them out. But let this not be a daily agenda. Let the governments function and deliver on their promises and commitments and leave it to the wisdom of 800 million Indian voters who will judge and decide. It cannot be a daily judgment, daily indictment. There's need in this country, I agree, to cut out red tape, because when there is a delay, I understand, delay means what? We make people petition, we make people wait, we make investments wait, the costs of investment rise, but I also know red tape and delay means corruption. If somebody is rent-seeking somewhere. We have tried to eliminate that. And I can say very proudly, in my ministry, in DGFT is the most e-enabled organization in the country today. This is all electronic. We have connected all ports, terminals. There's no physical filing. There's no physical interface. Anything you need, and those who are connected would know. But I'm not saying we are perfect. We need to do much more. We can't change overnight. We can't change mindsets. It requires a revolution. And a revolution has to be a responsible change. Each one of you, or us, are agents of the change. There's no individual, there is no single institution. If this country does need true governance reforms, this country also needs administrative reforms. You cannot be trapped in a system that we inherited 
from the colonial masters, it has to be connected with the realities of a complex and diverse country called the Republic of India. That must change. And I agree with the Supreme Court's observations that this should be there. But I would at the same time say this country also needs electoral reforms and India badly needs judicial reforms so that justice is made accessible and affordable to the poor people of the country, to the citizens of the Republic. Today, how many citizens of India can dream of going to a high court or a Supreme Court for justice? Can they even pay? You know the, what the fees are? You guys can pay. An ordinary Indian cannot, cannot get. That's why it must change. The discourse cannot be a fragmented one. The embrace has to be a national embrace of all issues. We have challenges. Challenges are always there in nations. We have a big challenge and a big strength when we talk of the population of India. Two-thirds are young. Our median age is 24. Even by 2040, India's population will remain the largest young population in the world. You'll not reach the median age, will not cross 35. That's a big strength, but that's a big challenge too. How do you connect to the youth? How do you show them that we are building an India of the future, an India where they have opportunities, an India of which they are proud of? That is a challenge, and that should be the national objective. The national mission of India on the move has to be this. Because we cannot close our eyes 13 states, the problem of Naxalism. Why? Why there are regions of India left out of the developmental process? Why the infrastructure is not there? Why their children cannot go to proper schools? Why they cannot dream like the children, the sons and daughters of those who are fortunate to be touched by development? This is an issue which India will have to deal with. And the sooner we do, the better. Now, whether we have a system which is moving towards transparency and accountability, the answer would be yes. Can we close our eyes that after the right to vote, the most important right which was given was the right to information? It's your right today. And somebody who denies you information will be punished. It's not just a right given. There are penalties. This is the strength of this country. Two days before parliament functions, when it functions, it functions. There's illuminating discussions. Parliament passed the Lokpal bill. But let me tell you, <coughs> the issue of corruption will be addressed by men and women who have character. You don't need too many institutions, this is my belief. Gandhi didn't need a Lokpal to lead us to freedom and bring the mightiest empire to its knees. But I do respect that there is need. Parliament, therefore, has taken a view. And the Lokpal will decide. You have judiciary, you have CVC, you have Comptroller Auditor General, and now we have. I feel, why I'm referring to this, the narrative must change. When we talk of India's story and what has gone wrong, it's not a virus India imported. It's a homegrown virus which we have allowed to thrive and we have re-exported to the world, telling, us, telling the whole world that there is something seriously wrong. There may be challenges. Why the positives have not been looked at? That during this period, as Naina was saying, you remain the first three favored destinations for foreign direct investment. And Ernst and Young now says the best, the most favored. Any report you see, OECD, World Bank, any investment agency, you are the first three, last few years. 136 billion of FDI has come in. When I assumed my present responsibility, as many of you would know, Rajan and Harsh and others, India's exports were barely 160. In 2004, our two-way trade was 130 billion. Today, it is almost 800 billion. 
Are we talking of that? Have you ever heard a serious discussion on inclusive growth? Have we ever included in the narrative the deprived? No. Nana referred to manufacturing and that's correct. Manufacturing is an imperative. Manufacturing is India's national priority. The share of manufacturing in our GDP is 16 percent, stagnant. Not that it is not growing, but mind you, the GDP has also grown. And agriculture is again almost the same. Can agriculture sustain 60 percent of India's people? The answer is a firm no. There is move towards urbanization. The young people are stepping out. Land cannot be stretched. Opportunities have to be created elsewhere. And opportunities shall, can only be created through the manufacturing processes. That's why India came out with a really futuristic national manufacturing policy, which the government put together, and I'm grateful to all, and satisfied that it was done. I have told this story. We thought about it. And I said to my officers, it was in January 2010, when in Jaipur I declared that India will have its own national manufacturing policy. I was wondering why we didn't have it after the industrial policy, why we did not do it. Because you have 150 million Indians will be joining the workforce by 2025. There's a social dimension. It's not only economic growth. If you don't create opportunities for the young people, it will be difficult to govern such a vast country. Therefore, manufacturing should be India's first priority. Services sector has grown, but there's a skewed growth. We are a global leader in IT, but where have we in electronics? 32 billion is the import of electronics, which we have to put down and start making it ourselves. Whether the chip fabrication, the government has sanctioned huge pro projects to big consortium, where government subsidies uh, to the tune of 27,000 crore will go. We are setting up the IT investment region, which has been declared one of the national investment and manufacturing zones. Now, how are we going to raise the share of manufacturing to 25%? This one principal instrument are national investment and manufacturing zones. Twelve of these, 13, plus one, the ITIR I refer to near Bangalore, stand approved. Master plan for eight has been completed and approved. One has rolled out three more of these cities. Eight are coming along the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, will be rolled out before the 31st of March. That's how fast we have moved. We have addressed the question of land that Naina was referring to. These are being developed by government in partnership with the states. We have cut through delays. There's effectively a single window approval mechanism put in place. Land will be the equity of the state. Land will not be alienated but given to the industry to create wealth, to create jobs for manufacturing. All the approvals will be in place. This will be integrated, greenfield, self-governed, self-regulated cities of the future India. For the first time, after decades, we invoked one article in our constitution, Article 243QC. It was invoked by Jawaharlal Nehru to build Chandigarh, and the second city which came up was Gandhinagar. Now we have invoked it to create industrial cities in India. That will change this country, make it a manufacturing hub of the world. We are attracting now investors from major developed countries, and I referred rightly to Japan. Japan is a big partner in Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor, which is referred to as the second most innovative infrastructure project ever conceived in the world the biggest infrastructure project under implementation. But are we stopping at that? The other one is moving now. Chennai, Bangalore, we have extended it, Tumkur, 
up to Chitradurga. We are creating the spine where UK is coming as a partner, they call the BMEC. That's the Bangalore Mumbai Economic Corridor. We are working on Amritsar to Kolkata. And very soon I'm going to move the cabinet for approval for Amritsar Kolkata Industrial Corridor. I'm sharing with you. These all things have never been discussed, never been referred to. That's my problem. They should become part of India's democratic discourse and narrative. And I would urge the media also that while it's the duty to inform public opinion, it has to be a balanced information. The young people must also know that this country is moving in the right direction, this country is changing, and this country has a future. There cannot be a greater hurt caused to any nation or society if the confidence of the youth is broken, if their faith in the system is shattered. That should never happen. I would say one thing, just to, before I conclude, that we have in this difficult period engaged more with the world. Whether, when our wisdom was questioned, we stepped out. 2009, we did a FTA with ASEAN countries. Now the investment and services chapter is also concluded. We signed a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with South Korea. We did with Japan, a very robust one, with Malaysia, we're negotiating with EU, complex with the RECs, the regional economic communities in Africa, including ECOWAS and SACU, with Mercosur, with the Andean communities in Latin Americas. Look where our investments have grown, how the diversification has helped. Today, 55 billion US dollars plus Indian investments in Africa. Let's revive. Whether I was wise or not, I said India will host it. September, India hosted 2009, which revived the stalled Doha process. Negotiators returned to Geneva. And it was again in Bali that the first ever, historic first, after the establishment of WTO, we have a pact, is the Bali package, is the first harvest of the DDA, the first trade pact after the conclusion of the Uruguay round and the establishment of WTO. And I'm grateful to those who came with India. We were able to put together a coalition of countries of Africa, Latin America, Caribbean. But at the same time, we did talk. Media referred to peace clause. I said in Parliament two days before, and I said in Bali, that it's, we were negotiating a trade pact. We were not at war. So there's a need of a peace clause. It's an interim mechanism linked to the future. We were able to create a mature understanding. And that mature understanding also needed the developed countries, United States of America and European Union. And I'm grateful, equally grateful to them too. Otherwise, the outcome would not have been, it would have been another addition to the failed ministerials. So I'm grateful to all. I knew that we carried the good wishes and blessings of our country with us. Last thing which I want to say to you, references to 2014, democracies always remain dynamic. 
But India is a land of Gandhi. India is a land which has given wisdom. The original melting pot in the civilizational history of humankind, where all faiths, people who were persecuted because of their faith in other countries, made India their home. We are home to all religions. We are home to all people. Irrespective of what happens, a strong India will have to be a liberal India. A strong India must be a secular India, one in which our sons and daughters have the courage to dream and realize their dreams. Thank you.